We were talking about proteins in the blood and the functions of some of these molecules that are present in the blood. And we left off talking about colloid osmotic pressure. Now, you remember from last semester, osmotic pressure, right? Osmotic pressure deals with the movement of water. And what is water going to be pulled toward? Ions, what's, what's the more general term? Salts close, salts, ions, similar solutes. Because it doesn't have to be ions, it doesn't have to be minerals, salts. It can also be proteins. And when proteins are functioning as solutes to attract water, that's when we call it colloid osmotic pressure. Solutes, in my mind, stuff because it can be a number of different items. So when we talk about the proteins, especially in the plasma, that are attracting water, they're going to be pulled from low concentrations of solutes to high concentrations. You remember our semi-permeable membrane example in AMP1? Hypertonic, hypotonic. The same thing is happening in your blood vessels. And so when we look at a capillary, and why do you think we're looking at a capillary? Yeah, that's for exchange Capillaries are the only vessels that allow for exchange. And so we'll touch on this even more when we get to circulatory system. But when we get in, uh, into a capillary, the blue line you see here, and we'll magnify that more in the next slide, that's going to be your blood pressure. This is the arterial end of the capillary, and you see it's illustrated in red. This is the venous end, so blood's coming in, blood's going out. The blood pressure is highest on the arterial end, and you see it decreases as you get to the venous end of the capillary. Why is your blood pressure decreasing? Because fluid's leaking out. You ever had a water hose that had a hole in it? What happens to the water pressure at the end? It goes down because it's leaking out along the way. That's what's happening to your blood pressure along the length of the capillary. The fluid leaks out, but the proteins don't necessarily leak out. So this flat yellow line that you see here, that is your oncotic pressure. The level and the concentration of the protein stays the same. So in the beginning, of the capillary, your blood pressure, the hydrostatic pressure, is greater pushing out than the proteins of that oncotic pressure pulling in, so fluid goes out at the beginning of the capillary. Are you saying osmotic or oncotic? Well, on, oncotic, colloid, those are all words that are meaning protein. Oncotic is another pressure of meaning protein with the osmotic pressure, pulling water toward the proteins of highest concentration, all right? Didn't mean to throw that word at you, but oncotic also means via protein. So this balance of blood pressure pushing fluid out, and then when you have low blood pressure at the venous end, now you can see there's more pressure from the protein to pull fluid back in. So fluid leaks out at the arterial end, and is drawn back into the blood vessel, into the capillary at the venous end because of the protein. And so it looks a little bit like that. See, there's that oncotic word for colloid osmotic. They just kind of put it together into oncotic. So fluid out, fluid back in. That's this capillary fluid cycle, kind of like, uh, you remember in middle school, is that where you had the weather science? where you have evaporation and the condensation in the rain and well, the hydrologic cycle. This is sort of like a hydrologic cycle with your capillaries. But not all of the fluid goes back into the capillary. Some stays in the fluid. That's where lymphatics, lymphatic capillaries, are going to drain that additional fluid. If you have a blockage of lymphatics, you're going to get major, major inflammation and sometimes really serious pathologic diseases like elephantiasis. 
And we'll touch on that when we get more into our circulatory. Uh, yeah, the diastolic is when your heart's not pushing. Right. And a lot of the diastolic, when we get to the heart, uh, is going to be because of the elastic fibers in your large vessels okay. that expand when you have systole and the heart contracts and push your highest pressure. And then when there's relaxation, the elasticity pulls back, and that's where you get your diastolic pressure. As you get older, that goes down and down because the elastic is all stretched out, kind of like the waistband of your favorite pair of underwear. The longer you have it, the less it works well. Yes? So, hydrostatic is fluid going out and hydrostatic is fluid going in. This is the force pushing fluid out because it, it's the dominant force at the arterial end. And the osmotic or oncotic, because of the protein, dominates bringing the fluid back in on the other side. And again, that's a concept that we're going to expand on when we get more into blood vessels and blood flow in the next chapter. <coughs> so we have those proteins that are there, like albumin. They can act as carriers, but they're there to be solutes primarily. But we also have a class of proteins that are called globulins. Now we have a lot of different, you know, alphas and beta globulins and they're characterized and grouped based on their function. And many of those are going to be carriers, much like albumin. But the ones that most people are familiar with are the gamma globulins. That was their name first. You know them more colloquially as antibodies. And when we get to the immune system, we're going to see there are a number of different types of antibodies. We're going to see that the IgG really, really good. I like the G for good. I don't know what to do with the E, but the E is the strongest of the antibodies. It elicits the strongest of your immune responses. And I really wish that they had made that one the IgA one, because these are the ones that give you the severe allergies. So I don't know how to do the E with allergies, because you got an A down here, that's not allergies. But we'll talk more about those when we get to the immune system chapter. But these are also circulating in the plasma of your blood. Now, this is one that we have, and, and you can really put this as a category of plasma proteins that are called clotting factors. Clotting factors. And this particular one is the final one to make a blood clot. There's a lot of them. But like fibrinogen, these are all floating in your plasma right now, normal conditions, in what kind of state, and there's an O-gen right there. What kind of state is that in? Inactivated, yeah. It's, it's not deactivated because we haven't activated it yet. It's inactive. Hugh? Did you say beta globulins are most effective? Uh, the previous slide. The beta globulins, they're just carriers. Oh, okay. No. So which one it's, did you say were most effective? Was it the E? This, the of the gamma globulins of the antibodies, the IgG, these are all antibodies. Okay. They're different isotypes of antibodies. And we'll really get to that when we get to the immune system. Just giving you an example of that. Fibrinogen is an inactive clotting protein. It must be inactive or else you will get a blood clot that's flowing through your body, which is a bad day. The active form, again, is when you clip off the ogen and you get fibrin. And we're going to talk about coagulation and clotting toward the end of this chapter. We may get to it today. I'm not sure. So another category of plasma proteins are clotting factors, fibrinogen is the most potent and it is the final one to begin to make this netting of protein, this real sticky netting that is the blood clot. And there we go. Now, if you activate these clotting factors and remove them from the plasma, you're left with what is called serum. And it's gonna be a different color than just your I think they call it straw-colored plasma. 
So that's the difference between pure plasma with the clotting factors and serum that has had the clotting factors removed. Now, just to kind of quickly go through some of these, there are too many really to mention, but we already talked about circulating hormones, right? We have biogenic amines, we have steroids, and what's our other group of circulating hormones? Proteins. So, of course, they're going to fit into our plasma protein category. We also have enzymes, and many of our clotting factors that are inactive are in fact inactive enzymes that work in this cascade that eventually leads to the formation of a blood clot. <clears throat> now let's look at some of the specifics that we have in our blood. We talked about plasma, we talked about the fluid nature, how much water, the proteins. Now when we look at the formed elements, the white blood cells, the red blood cells, and platelets. We're going to produce these, and largely they're coming from your bone marrow, through a process that's called hemopoiesis or also hematopoiesis. And this is going to be all of the formed elements. And this mostly is going to be happening in your long bones, like your femur, your humerus, Radius ulna, those long bones in the red marrow. Do you know why it's called the red marrow? Because you're producing red blood cells. What would yellow marrow contain? Fat. fat. And that's what the dogs are going after, and that's why they chew on bones. They want to get to the fat, because that's the rich, tasty stuff to dogs. We don't like fat, do we? Stop. I don't want to talk about it. That steak's got to be marbled, right? And that marbling, the white in the steak, is that, yeah, makes it rich. Now, with, with hematopoiesis, we're going to start with a stem cell. And this is in your bone marrow. There are a couple of different levels of these stem cells. A fertilized egg is referred to as a totipotent cell. Totipotent. Totally capable of producing every single cell that you now have in your body. Does that kind of freak you out a little bit? Yeah. To know you started as a single-celled organism. And that single cell began to divide, and that single cell produced all that you are, all of your embryonic membranes that you were wrapped in, and half of the placenta all came from that single fertilized egg. So that's a totally capable cell of producing everything. And as these cells divide, they lose that ability to become everything. And so sometimes they're referred to as pluripotent. They can become a lot of different things, but not everything. And then a multipotent cell, as we see in this example, that's going to give rise to all of our formed elements. So we start with a particular type of stem cell that can give rise to lymphocytes, can give rise to macrophages, uh, I'm sorry, megakaryocytes, can give rise to the macrophages in this particular example. All of your red and white blood cells and platelets come from a single type of stem cell. But you notice it branches, right? So let's look at the branch. The lymphocytes, they're going to be on this right-hand side. And when we talk about lymphocytes, we're really talking about two types of lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes, and what helps the T lymphocytes mature? What organ? The thymus and the thymic hormones, that helps T lymphocytes mature. And we also have the B lymphocytes that are going to be a cell that's going to lead to the production of antibodies. Here's another one of my pet peeves, and a lot of textbooks say this. We'll harp on it again when we get to the immune system. B lymphocytes do not make antibodies. B lymphocytes do not make antibodies. B lymphocytes make plasma cells 
and it's the plasma cells that make antibodies. But you see they come from the B lymphocytes, and so sometimes these, these people that write these books shorten it, but I want you to know how it really happens. So that's the lymphoid line. Everything else, all of the other formed elements, are going to come from what is referred to as the myeloid cell line. So we've got our red blood cells. We've got our other white blood cells other than our lymphocytes. And we've got these big things, the megakaryocytes that are producing the platelets. All of that comes from a separate stem cell that's a myeloid stem cell versus a lymphoid stem cell. Now, I believe this illustration came from your textbook, and I did not see this early enough before I posted my PowerPoint online. But you notice I took something out right there. If you have an older presentation, is there something right there between the erythrocyte and the myoblast? What does that say? Mast cell. Mast cell. Scratch that out. A mast cell is another name for a basophil. So again, you have to critically look at some of these illustrations as you're reading these books. And if you look at uh, scientific or medical articles to make sure the information is correct. So take out the basophil right there. And I'm not even going to put it. We'll talk about basophils when we get into the immune system chapter. But a, base of, a basophil is this type of white blood cell inside the circulation. And when the basophil crawls out of the bloodstream, out into your tissues, then we change the name to a mast cell. So I'm not sure why somebody put it there. Yeah. So when you hear about lymphoma and myeloma a lot, what like, cells are the most affected? Like, what cells are these, these are all coming from bone. And they're, I, I would say myeloma is coming from some of these early stem cells. And it is, it's a horrible um, uh, type of leukemia. Leukemia, leukocyte, again, white, white blood cell cancer. Would you say that the myeloid line is more focused on growth and then the lymphoid is like protection of the growth? Or is that too general of a statement? Well, when you look at your immune system, you have cell-mediated immunity with the T lymphocytes and humoral immunity with the B. So this is immune system. Um, You've also got immune system with all of these, the monocyte slash macrophage. Monocyte is in the circulation. When it goes out into the tissues, we rename it into a macrophage. These are the vacuum cleaners. These are protecting against vascular damage. So, I, man, it's like they're all protecting. Except the red blood cells, they're transporting your oxygen and processing carbon dioxide. So, he. I, I, I see the generalization you're making. I think it's a little more specific than that. Yes, sir. You said B lymphocytes don't form what? B lymphocytes don't make antibodies. B lymphocytes produce plasma cells, and when we get to the immune system, they make memory cells as well. That's why vaccines work. And the plasma cells are the antibody factories. But you can't get a plasma cell without a B cell, so... So if, if you're going to use RNA vaccine, you're going to have that RNA producing a protein after it's gone into a cell. Okay. And that's then what uh, the immune system recognizes, this foreign protein, versus making a lot of the protein and injecting that to get an immune response. Okay. So that's a little bit of the difference. So hematopoiesis, blood formed element development, generation. Now specifically... Erythropoiesis speaks to just red blood cells. And that's where we get erythropoietin. We already introduced that as one of our important hormones. Leukopoiesis, leukocyte, white blood cell production. And again, we talked about erythropoietin quite a bit about how it increases when you're short on oxygen. When you're anemic, 
you're going to have a greater production of erythropoiesis, erythropoietin, to try to produce more red blood cells. So get familiar with leuco for white blood cells, erythro for red blood cells. Now, you do not have to memorize this. But this is another example of having a stem cell. And in this case, instead of multi, they use pluripotent. This might be an older terminology. But here's your my myeloid stem cell, your lymphoid stem cell. You lead to the T's. There's your B cell, your B lymphocyte, plasma cell line. These, these uh, CFUs, those are colony forming units. That's kind of a microbiology <laughs> term. But these are other stem cells that lead to your red blood cell line. You notice something funky that happens to your red blood cell as it develops? Nucleus. What's that dark dot? The yeah, I got nucleus, nucleus, whoop, where'd it go? You shed the nucleus, and so your mature circulating erythrocytes don't have a nucleus. Is that like a protection against the DNA? Not exactly. We're going to get to that in just a bit. But be thinking, why would that be a good thing to shed the nucleus? Because when you shed the nucleus, that's a countdown clock to death. The, the fuse is lit and you got 120 days, you're going to die. Because you can't fix anything, can't make new, new in, something that's broken. 120 days and you're dead. But these are all the different cell lineages here. Oh, you can even see it here. See basophil? Oh, I hate that kind of got cut off, but there's your mast cell. It's the same cell, just locational there. And then there's monocyte in the circulation, macrophage outside the circulation. Erythrocytes, red blood cells, biconcave disc, squish jelly donut. Squish jelly donut. That's the, it's a squish jelly donut. I cannot eat a jelly donut unless I squish the jelly out first. I just, it's a must. I think it's a law. And so you can see we remove the nucleus, but then we squish the cell. Or it collapses on itself, which, whichever way you want to look at it. I want you to think, begin to think, the next slide we're going to talk about it, and I want, I want you really to think. When we look at the red blood cells, and you're going to have a lot of red blood cells per cc, one milliliter. They're filled with hemoglobin. Each red blood cell has 280 million molecules of hemoglobin. But because we don't have a nucleus, we only survive for 120 days. Yes. And then look how many red blood cells per cc, and you have five liters of blood. That's a lot of zeros when you talk about how many molecules of hemoglobin you have in your whole body. That's a lot of zeros. I don't know how many. Are you going to ask me how many? No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm going to ask if I need to know specifically. Yes, yes. She did that all last semester, and my answer was always yes. No, not always. <laughs> I was hoping it wasn't always. Yes. So when you give blood, is it only good for 120 days? Mm. When you give blood, is it only good for 120 days? They refrigerate it. Right. They keep it cool so it extends the lifespan. Uh, wait, let me say it. It extends the shelf life, kind of like your groceries. I don't know exactly how long they keep the blood around in the blood bank. We can find that out. So do people in colder climates live longer? <laughs> no. Yeah, polar bears. No I, no, I don't think they live longer. So here's the question. You remove the nucleus. You squish down the middle. Wouldn't it be better to leave this as a round cell and pack more hemoglobin per red blood cell? Don't scream out the answer. Think about it. Why would it not be an advantage to be able to pack more hemoglobin into a round cell? So here's what we're working with now. And what does hemoglobin do? Transports what? Oxygen. Oxygen. And in our current biconcave disc shape, 
there is a fairly large surface area to inside volume. If it was round, we would have a lot more volume to surface area, but we'd have a lot more hemoglobin molecules. Doesn't that seem more advantageous? Again, when you're looking at your body and the way your body works and biology in general, if something happens a certain way, there's got to be a survival advantage to it. And so here is your hint. Look right down here. More efficient diffusion. Do you remember diffusion from AMP1? What is one way you can increase the rate of diffusion? Decreasing the area or like the distance between. Decreasing the distance across a membrane. So if you had a big round red blood cell, oxygen would not be able to diffuse to the middle because the hemoglobin socks it all up. And by the time oxygen would get to the middle, you're back at the lungs ready to exchange it again. So this is the most efficient shape with which you can saturate the hemoglobin with oxygen. And when we get to the respiratory chapter, we're going to look at the pulse ox. What's the pulse ox? The oxygen saturation of your blood. Back during COVID, you had to have the little thing on your finger, and when you go to the doctor, you probably have to still do that. Typically, with your biconcave discs, your oxygen saturation is going to be between 95 and 98% under normal conditions. You're perfectly efficient. You don't need more. Plus, making protein is energetically expensive. And you can't make any more because the nucleus is gone. So this is the optimal shape for our red blood cells. <clears throat> Bless you. All right, white blood cells, immune cells, lymphocytes, leukocytes. Unlike your red blood cells, white blood cells have the capacity to attach to the endothelial lining of your blood vessel via different partner receptors. They're flowing along really, really good, but then all of a sudden the leukocyte will start rolling, and that rolling kind of slows it down, and the receptors kind of hang on, kind of like the parachutes on a dragster, until it stops. And then once it stops, it begins to squeeze itself, kind of like an amoeba. It squeezes between the junctions of the endothelial cells out into the tissues, and that, that process of squeezing through the, the wall of the blood vessel is called diapodesis. And that's how white blood cells follow these chemical signals from other immune system cells that say, hey, we've got a bad something out here, come help. Diapodesis of the leukocytes. <clears throat> Now, we have two classes, and we're not going to talk about them specifically here. We'll talk about these in the immune system chapter. But we've got granulocytes and agranulocytes. Let me make these words not as scary. We already know what C-Y-T-E-S, cites. What does that mean? Cells. Granulo. Cells that are full of granules. They're, they're granules that you can see in a microscope. Basophils have blue granules. Eosinophils have red granules. Neutrophils have granules. The color of a red blood cell looks neutral. I guess that's why they named those. When you stick the letter A or A-N, and, in front of a word, what does that mean? Not. So you got cells with granules and cells that don't have granules. That's all those two categories mean. And again, we will talk specifically about who belongs in these categories when we get to the immune system chapter. Thrombopoiesis. Thrombocytes are called what? What's another name for thrombocytes? Platelets. Does it bother you they're called thrombocytes? Why would it bother you? 
They're not cells, they're pieces of cells. And it's pretty cool how they're made. You're in the bone marrow and the bone marrow has blood vessels running through it. You have blood vessels that run through your bone tissue. If you've ever broken a bone, you're gonna have a pretty good hemorrhage, you're gonna have a big old bruise because your bones are gonna bleed if you break them. But this big, huge megakaryocyte extends these processes between the endothelial cells and they just have them hanging out into the flow of blood in this capillary. And that blood's moving pretty fast because of the hydrostatic pressure, your blood pressure. And as it does, that force breaks off these little piece, pieces. They're first, they're, they're called proplatelets, but the fragments then that we have are the platelets. And that's going to keep happening over and over and over until finally you basically have a membrane-bound bunch of nuclei that just dies. And then your immune system cells come gobble it up and recycle. So megakaryocytes and the little fragments that break off of these extensions into the bloodstream, those then are our business end of stopping the bleeding with platelets. <clears throat> so cell fragments. They are going to form the first, well not the first, one of the first attempts at stopping a vascular injury and preventing the loss of blood. And preventing the loss of blood is called hemostasis. Blood clotting is one of the ways we're going to do that, but we have really three ways that we're going to do that. This illustration showing a, an injury and then the little things that look like sticker burrs. Does anybody else think those look like sticker burrs? You know you're from East Texas if you pull these out of your feet in the summertime. Well, these, these are sticky. The platelets are going to be sticky. Notice they're swimming around here. They're just round, almost look like little white red blood cells. No. When they become activated, they get angry. They form processes and they get really, really sticky. They become those little sticker birds? Yeah. The yeah, so the platelets here, you see them floating, look like little frisbees. Mm -hmm. But then when they get down here and get activated, whoo, sticker birds. And they become really, really sticky. And we're going to look at that when we get to forming what is called a platelet plug. So we'll go through that process. What do the red blood cells do? Here? Yes. When the platelets start getting sticky, everything sticks. Because okay. you're just trying to plug the hole with whatever you got. Okay. It's not going to do any good if the red blood cells leak out. That's the only way red blood cells get out of the circulation, and that's a bad day when that happens. So they're either going out or they're going to stick and try to plug the hole so not as many people get out. And if we thought 120 days was a short time for red blood cells, look at platelets. Eight to 10 days. They're not around for long. All right, so, so that's all of our formed elements and the components, but I want to get back to hemoglobin as a part of our red blood cell. So like where along the process do things like blood and anticoagulants work? When we get to coagulation, we'll point that out. <coughs> So when we looked at how many molecules of hemoglobin were in red blood cells and how many red blood cells per cc in five liters, we've got a lot of hemoglobin. Well, hemoglobin is a protein that has a tertiary structure. Oh, you remember that from AMP1? Primary structure is the amino acid sequence. Secondary structure is how it's folded into alpha helices and beta sheets. Tertiary structure is its globular final form of the protein. And what is quaternary structure? Multiple proteins. Multiple proteins working together. So hemoglobin is four protein chains, two alphas and two betas. That's adult hemoglobin. You also have some chains that are formed that are fetal hemoglobin chains. So your, your babies are going to have a fetal version of hemoglobin that is more attractive to oxygen than adult hemoglobin. That's important because where is your baby in your womb getting oxygen? 
from you, from mom in the placenta. So when mom's blood passes close by the fetal blood in the uterus, I mean in the um, um, placenta, the attractive force for oxygen in the baby's blood is much stronger than that in mom's blood. So the baby in your womb, and you're probably going to hear me say this, if you took my developmental biology class, you would hear me say this all the time. Your unborn baby is a parasite. It takes your nutrition, it takes your oxygen, it takes your energy, and they're going to take your money until they're about 30 years old or older. Huh? Well, my, old, my oldest is just turned 30, so I'm working on it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, then you got grandkids and you really lose a lot of money. All right. So here in each one of our four globin chains, the four protein globin chains, in the very center, you have an arrangement of amino acids that have these nitrogenous uh, units here. And these are called the heme group. And each one of these amino acid formulations here is capable of binding an ion of iron. And it's going to have it in the very center. So oxygen binds to the iron that's captured in the middle of the heme group that's within each one of our globin chains. So now... Think of how many molecules of hemoglobin you have per red blood cell times four, and that's how many molecules of oxygen can be transported by a single red blood cell. Again, that's a lot of zeros. And I still get winded when I do And you still, I don't want to talk about it. I get winded walking up a flight of stairs. Now, the iron transports oxygen, but remember, carbon dioxide really is not efficiently transported by hemoglobin. I think about 15% of the carbon dioxide that gets transported in your blood is bound to the protein, the globin chain. The rest is converted into carbonic acid and then becomes a bicarbonate ion. And it's just going to be dissolved in the plasma. So really, hemoglobin transports oxygen. That's its almost singular purpose. Yeah? This is, see, hemoglobin is not a major transporter of CO2. Only about 15% gets transported this way. Okay. Carbon dioxide primarily is transported in a different way. Okay. And again, that'll be respiratory system. Now, red blood cells survive for 120 days. And after 120 days, I guess kind of like people, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm going to kind of go redneck on you. Old country people get ornery. You, under, you understand that word? Ornery. 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 Cratchity. That's another one. Ornery. Cratchity. Old dogs don't learn new tricks. What does that mean? Old dogs don't learn new tricks. You are set in your ways. You're not flexible. Right? You're not flexible. Old red blood cells are not flexible. Because a red blood cell is about 8 microns in diameter, which is about the diameter of a capillary. They have to go through the capillary single file. I think we got a picture of that. Let me scooch back here. Yeah, see, here's a capillary. You see how the red blood cells are lined up like stacks of pennies? I think Dr. Rouleau saw that. He stuck his name on it. That's called Rouleau formation. But they go through in single file. And when red blood cells get to be about 120 days old, they get very rigid. They're not flexible. And they could potentially cause a blockage in the capillaries. So in the spleen, you have these things that are called sinusoids. Now, some of this can happen in the liver, but primarily if you've got a spleen, that's where it's going to happen. These sinusoids look like whiskey keg, whiskey barrels that 
have had the rings taken off so there's some space between the oak planks. And these, these boards in the spleen, they're cells, called stab cells. They're wrapped with collagen, kind of like the metal rings of that whiskey barrel. And red blood cells, because of your blood pressure, are squeezed between those stab cells. Now, young red blood cells are flexible, right? They just squeeze right through, and it's actually like going through a car wash. They get the stuff scraped off their surface. But 120-day-old red blood cells, when they hit that gap and they're not, they don't squeeze through, it's like putting them through a paper shredder. They get ripped apart because of the blood pressure pushing them through. Now we got a whole lot of dead and dying red blood cells that are ripped apart, a whole lot of hemoglobin to deal with, and you lose about two million every second. Well, what else does that mean? If you lose two million every second, what are you also doing? You got to make two million every second. Now, fortunately, your body's pretty good at recycling a lot of the stuff. But the stuff from a red blood cell is not always good stuff. I know that's kind of hard to believe. But when we look at the globin chains, the protein, yeah, we recycle that, break it down into amino acids. That's no big deal. But this heme group and the iron, that's a little bit of a different topic. Because when we talk about iron, an ion of iron, is iron hydrophilic or hydrophobic? Iron sinks. Iron's just iron. It's not going to dissolve in water. It's going to sit in with the... It's just... You put a nail in water, what happens? Nothing. It rusts over time. So what happens with the iron is it gets coated with a hydrophilic protein in the blood, transferrin. You see how we got that catchy name? What letter does iron have in the periodic chart? Fe, ferrous. So we've got the ferrin for iron, trans, because we're going to transport it somewhere. We've captured it and coated it with a hydrophilic coating. Now we can move it around without too much trouble. Transferrin's a protein. It's a protein. Yeah, transferrin's a protein. Then we store it with another protein wrapped around it called ferritin. This moves it around transferrin. This kind of locks it in place in storage in your bone marrow and in your liver as ferritin-wrapped iron. And you can reuse it to make new hemoglobin active with iron. But here's the problem, and it says small amount. I, I think it may be as much as 5 to 7% of the iron in your body you lose every day in all your stuff that you're getting rid of. Your sweat, your urine, your feces, in your, your menstrual cycle, shedding of your skin at night. All right, so we dealt with the globin chains. We dealt with the iron. Now this is the business end, and you're probably clinically going to run into this more than anything else. Because this heme group is not water-soluble. I think that's one of the ways it's able to interact with iron. And so the first thing that you have to do when you break down the hemoglobin from your red blood cells and they really should have made this the spleen. I don't know why they didn't. I t that's okay. I had someone during a test. I had, I had someone during a test one time. Their phone went off. And they did not move. I still don't know to this day. Who's, I think they just abandoned the phone. Because it was a polka. So. What's a polka? A beer barrel I don't even know. I mean, you know what when you hear it? Take a sea shanty and make it even more bad in a polka. Is this during the test of last semester? No, this is a long this time ago. This is one that, that went off during last semester. Uh, somebody's phone went off 
I, it wasn't a polka. Because I was laughing when that one went off. Okay. So the heme group is converted into an insoluble molecule called bilirubin. Bilirubin goes to the liver where it is converted into a conjugated form that then is water soluble. But that sort of suggests that you've got a healthy liver to do it. We know hepatitis? Hepatitis. What, does it, what organ is attacked with hepatitis? The liver. Hepa is liver. Um, so hepatitis is a problem. Cirrhosis of the liver. What lifestyle is probably going to result in cirrhosis of the liver? Alcoholism. It destroys the liver. Your liver tries to get the alcohol out of your blood. You destroy it. Now you're not going to be taking care of the bilirubin correctly. Premature babies don't really have a good functioning liver and they've got a lot of red blood cell breakdown during the process of being delivered. It is a very stressful process. So they're going to have a lot to remove. And in those cases, you're probably going to run into these patients that are unable to remove the bilirubin, even conjugated, either in your feces as stercobilin, and it's the bilirubin breakdown product and the stercobilin that gives the brown color to your feces. But then we also have a yellow pigment called urobilin in the kidneys that is also removing the bilirubin from your body. That's why you have the yellow color of your urine. Now, if you have a buildup of bilirubin in your body, what is one of the key diagnostic characteristics that you have that problem? Your skin and your eyes turn yellow. Here's a preemie that is bright, bright yellow. And that clinical condition is called jaundice. Too much bilirubin. It's built up in your tissues. The good news is it's pretty easily reversed by sunlight. Back in the day, the doctors used to tell mom, hey, take the baby, go sit in the window. Sit by the window or sit out on the porch on a sunny day. Let the baby get a suntan. As, as recent as, let me see how old is my middle daughter, 25 years old, my baby came home from the hospital with premature jaundice. They gave us a suitcase that you lift it up about 45 degrees and it had these billy lights in the top of the suitcase. You had to strip them down and this got little Velcro tabs on the side on their temples and they wear these little cloth sunglasses. Now, the doctor made us just put them in there naked because you want as much skin support as possible. And so me being the worried dad that I just always am with all my kids, I would not sleep with her in that suitcase. I was afraid the lid would close. And so I'm sitting here, and my daughter's just like, oh, yeah. Hey, Dad, turn me over. Okay, I'm ready to turn over you. Yeah. But these lights, either sunlight or artificial, is sufficient then to convert bilirubin into a water-soluble form that then the body can slowly excrete. All right, you got an injury. We need to stop the bleeding. There are three steps. First, your blood vessels are going to spasm and constrict. What happens to the blood flow when your blood vessels constrict? It slows, down. slows down. It's constricting where you've got the injury trying to restrict the flow of blood to that area so that you slow down the blood flow, thus you slow down the loss of the blood. You also have platelet plug. Now, these do not occur completely independently of each other. The vascular spasm usually occurs more rapidly 
The platelet plug is a little bit later, but these are both going on at the same time. This one is just first to come on, this is next to come on. And this is an example of a platelet plug being formed here. And then you have the actual clot form that we call coagulation. There are a lot more steps involved in forming a platelet plug and infinitely more in coagulation, but this is the long-term clot that is going to really stop the bleeding altogether. All right, so vascular spasm, platelet plug, and actually forming the clot as our third step. Again, one is not gonna start and then stop, and then you have the other start and stop. They're overlapping, but they really do begin in that order. So vascular spasm, vasoconstriction, the blood vessel getting smaller, and it's because of the smooth muscle in that region just clamping down as much as possible. Again, it's not to stop the blood getting out the injury, it's to stop the flow of blood into the area. And that can happen immediately to, uh, in response to the injury. So vascular spasm, constrict, we're slowing down the flow, slowing down the leak, and that gets us to the next phase. And this is not gonna stop. Even though we start the platelet plug, we're not stopping the vascular spasm, that, that's going to be clamped down for a while. It's kind of like a tourniquet. So when we look at platelet fuck, first, the platelets are inactivated while they're swimming around. Normal conditions. They don't start sticking to anything or each other, primarily because the endothelial cells are coated with prostacyclin, one of our acosinoids, and that is basically a platelet repellent. Also, there's a charge on the surface of our endothelial cells that is the same charge as on the surface of platelets. Because what attracts? Opposites attract, same charges repel. So it's almost like the platelets are skidding along here like the puck on an air hockey table. It's just riding on that surface, it's not actually touching. But then as soon as you damage the vessel and now you're exposing the proteins underneath the endothelial cells in the basement membrane and your interstitial molecules like collagen, once the platelets encounter collagen, and there's actually a molecule bound to collagen that's called von Willebrand's factor, you don't have to know that one, but there are a lot of factors that lead to that. That's gonna activate the platelets. They're gonna turn into sticker burrs they're going to get sticky, they're going to stick to the endothelial cells, they're going to stick to each other, and they are going to secrete thromboxane, again, a cosinoid, and thromboxane is going to do what? Activate the spasms, activate more platelets, and now you've got a positive feedback loop to get more and more platelets activated, more and more and stronger vascular spasms. You're, again, you're trying to stop the bleeding. Yeah? Platelets uh, release thromboxane? Yes. Okay. And that leads to more vascular spasms, longer, stronger, and more platelets get attracted to and are activated. That really should be activated in the area of the injury. But that's why the acosinoids, those hormones, even though they say circulating, you don't want this happening all through the bloodstream. You want it just happening at the injury site. And that's why we put that asterisk on the acosinoids, the local hormones. I'm sorry, your question? I was just going to ask, how does that work with like blood clots that just form without your like, injury? There are other things that nucleate and initiate those clots. One of the big things is cholesterol and the plaques that build up. And then also, uh, bleeding disorders and other blood conditions that can cause clotting at the wrong time, all right? All right, so just as we're winding up here, it takes about a minute for a platelet plug to form, but platelet plugs are not completely stable right away. They're gonna actually be incorporated into the clot, which locks them into place. But with a positive feedback, 
the chain reaction, you've got to have a way to stop it, right? It just can't keep going and going until all your blood is just jelly. So, as the platelet plug grows, you're going to have prostacyclin secreted by the endothelial cells that then slows down and stops the activation of more platelets. That is going to then lead to the next step, the coagulation step, the formation of our net, the clot of fibrin, and we'll cover that Thursday. Bring your notes for 19 because we will wrap this up Thursday and go on and start with heart, blood vessels, all that good stuff. Bring our notes for 19. Chapter 19. Your chapter 19 notes, slides, oh, whatever. I'm I, like, 